We are back. Thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment. We want to hear from you. Today's guest is Marty Friedman. If you're going to see him on tour, post a comment what date you're going to. And if you are going to New England Metal Fest or not fest this weekend, post a comment and let us know if we will see you there. Speaking of New England Metal Fest, it is happening this week. Make sure you get your tickets now. The pre-party is Friday, September 20th. God forbid, Rivers of Nile, Johnny Booth, Living Wreckage, Death Ray Vision, and more. Saturday's lineup is absolutely insane. Kill Switch Engage 25th anniversary with Machine Head, Converge, Nails, Overkill, After the Burial, Better Lovers, Full of Hell, and many, many more. Sunday is Slaughter to Prevail, Suicidal Tendencies, As I Lay Dying, Bane, Suicide Silence, Terror, Shadow, Intent. It is going to be incredible. Get your tickets. Let us know. Leave a comment if you are going to the show. Say hi to Sean the Butcher. Say hi to all the Kill Switch guys. Rob Flynn, Converge. Shout out to Jake. Speaking of Jake, the new Many Eyes album is out. And Jake and his awesome label, Death Wish Inc., are helping us distribute my label, Perseverance Music Group. You'll see, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see we're showing a picture of the shirt, of the vinyl. We blew out of the first pressing, but they've added more. Go to deathwishinc.com and get your Many Eyes, the Light Age limited edition album on, uh, I think it's Sunflare is the repress color, but you'll see. And the band has them on the road. If you're going to go see Many Eyes with Sum 41 and the Interrupters, let us know. Or they have... A special CD release show this week, Thursday the t or Friday the twentieth, at the Auto Bar. Many Eyes, Gray Shape, and Humble Abode. For merch and other tour dates, go to Many Eyes Music. And again, big thank you to Jake, Converge, Rich, everybody at DeathWishInc.com. Go support them as well. Also, thank you to Blast Beats Vinyl, a boutique online extreme metal vinyl shop based in New Jersey, owned and operated by a lovely husband and wife, Roni. Ronnie and Amit? Is it Roni or Ronnie? Sorry. Uh, check out BlastBeatsVinyl.com and use the code MMF and you will save 10% off for a limited time, okay? The code is MMF, like Milwaukee Metal Fest, over at Blast Beats Vinyl. You'll see, I'm about to buy this ingested vinyl right now. They got a bunch of cool colors and a bunch of uh, limited edition vinyl over there. Big thanks to Blast Beats Vinyl. I might have to get them some of this Corpse Grinder vinyl that we found when we moved. That's right, we unearthed uh, a bunch of yellow copies that you can get at martyrstore.net, and we found some hoodies just in time for the fall. They were in a box that uh, we lost when we moved warehouses, but those are up now, white long sleeves as well. You can get them at uh, martyrstore.net, M-A-R-T-Y-R-S-T-O-R-E.net. And since we have the Hapri tour starting this month, meet and greets are almost sold out. So you can get those at martyrstore.net as well. And you can get the Hapreed tour shirt and a signed poster. If you're not able to make the show or not able to make the meet and greet, you can get it online for a limited time. Okay. Before we get to our episode with Marty Friedman, last but certainly not least, the mighty indie merch store.com. Your one-stop shop for all things metal, hardcore, grindcore, death metal. So many great releases, so many cool pieces of merch, apparel, accessories, all that. Use the code JOSTA10 at checkout and you will save 10%. It is that easy. So say you want that Slayer Root of All Evil t-shirt, you go to checkout, it says it's $24.99, boom, you put in JOSTA10, now it's $22.49. 10% off when you use the code JOSTA10 at IndieMerchStore.com. All right, we have the Axe Man himself. My God, I love this dude. Marty Friedman, you know him, you love him. Now on to the show. My friend, the lead singer of Hate Breed, the infamous and notorious Jamie Jasta is in the building. That's what's up. Jamie Jasta from the metal band Hate Breed. That guy's famous. Coffee, death metal, and push-ups. That's Jamie Jasta. Remember Jamie Jasta? You know him. He's podcast, but he's also he's a metal fan. I would say you need that. That shit is hard. <laughs> there he is. 
What's up, my brother? What's up, Marty? Good to see you, man. Great to see you, man. Long time no see. How you been? Yeah, been okay. No complaints. Just did two two gigs, and now I'm back getting the podcast back up and running. Got very the, uh, cool gigs with your band. Yep, we did uh, two two 30th anniversary shows with Hatebreed. One in my home state, which uh, we did keep the guest list under 200 people, which I was very proud of. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, one in Kentucky, which was more of a hardcore show, no barricade, no no production, half stacks, <sighs> everybody standing on the stage. You know, it was fun. How cool is that, man? Well, congratulations, thirty years. That's something else. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we we got a tour coming up in the fall with Carcass, but these were like kind of the test shows. We 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 did some production. Uh, the py- the fire marshal gave us the okay for pyro, but the insurance underwriter came in at the last minute trying to jack the price. So we couldn't do, we did CO2, but we couldn't do the pyro, (laughs) but looking up all that stuff was really fun. Like the cold sparklers, like when, when you do your big shows in Japan, do you, do you get to choose that stuff? Do you try to design a a, a different type of show with that stuff? Do you want to do different production? It all depends on the gigs. It really depends on the gigs. I do such a wide variety of gigs to from very small, intimate gigs with cellos and pianos to big gigs, either with my own band or with other artists where they have all that kind of, you know, sparkling things and flames and all that. And so it goes through, runs the whole gamut. And I pretty much just stay out of it and let the people who are putting together that side of the business do it so but, uh, but have I you like all that stuff man i'm a kiss fan from way back so the more the better but uh, it's not something i fixate on really that much okay so you don't usually want to say like you just like hey block me off like mark my spot so i don't get singed or i don't get uh frozen with co2 or i don't know do you do you freeze from that it felt pretty well, I, cold <laughs> i got a funny story about that i was playing <laughs> with this artist named ame and she is like uh i would say she's the beyonce of asia and uh, we toured cities in china and and in uh, singapore and hong kong and every country in asia and it was just massive we were playing stadiums and stuff and we did this mtv awards show in um i think it was in china for mtv china and it was she got some award and we performed the song just me and her and um we did the rehearsal and it was all fine it was great and then comes time for the live it was live broadcast for the actual show and we're playing the song just a vocal and my guitar and all of a sudden these bombs start going off and huge flames 10 foot flames are coming up from all over the stage i'm like what the hell is going on here it was like a war zone they didn't tell us at least they didn't tell me anything during rehearsal that hey there's going to be a bunch of pyro going off during the real show so i was just like hoping that wherever i was standing was not going to be like a landmine and just to get through the song i could not believe what was going on and uh, uh that that's china for you though china is a, a, you know somehow it all works out but as you're doing it you can't believe that it's going to work out oh it's wild style so there was yeah. no x's there was no taped markers no, it just no, was nothing no oh nothing we, <laughs> rehearsal was great yeah this is going to be breeze i'm like the hell is going on <laughs> And after wow. it said, yeah, it looks so cool. It looks so cool. No shit, it looked cool. <laughs> so who do you go to? Do you go to the tour manager, the production manager, and be like, hey, can you give me a warning for the next show? Like, what do you it do? It was kind of a thing. I went to the translator, and uh, once it was done and we survived, I survived the thing, you know, and it was kind of kind of funny. But in that particular situation, I was only me and the singer and the staff. And the only person on this entire staff who spoke English or Japanese was the translator. So that was the only person I could talk to about it. And she was like, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. I'm like, it is what it is. What's going on here? (laughs) You could have had the two worst case scenarios are like the the Michael Jackson Pepsi moment or the the Hatfield GNR show moment. Right. Like those can really happen, man. Um, and, you know, if it happened to uh, Hetfield or Michael Jackson, you know, that stuff can really happen, you know, and especially in a 
country where communication with other languages is not really paramount, so to speak. That being said, it was the totally coolest, coolest experience uh, playing with Ame and stuff like that. I just remember that MTV situation was unforgettable. You know, you feel the flames. You know how it is when it's that close. It gets literally very, very hot right in front of you. You just don't know where they're going to come up from. Yeah. And, and the concussion bombs, if you don't know the count, the cue, like the the countdown for that, and you don't have earplugs in, I've had it where I was, I was actually behind Slipknot's backdrop uh-huh. and I was trying to go through to get to the other side. And I had no idea they were coming. I almost shit my pants behind the backdrop. <laughs> like just, you know, cause I didn't want to go on stage. There was all like security and they were saying, and I had a pass, I had an all access pass, but they were like, no, no, no. But I didn't, I didn't see the set or, or know the cues and those concussion bombs went off and yeah, the whole place rattled stuff came down from the ceiling that had been like, you know, knocked loose from the ceiling. I'm like, what is that? Asbestos? I don't know. <laughs> like it, I could imagine being in China and being, that could be, that would be really scary. I wonder if it's oh, on boy. YouTube. Have you ever looked it up to see if you could see like what your reaction was in the moment? I, you know what? That's a good idea. I never looked it up. Um, I'm sure it's probably there with uh, the title and everything in Chinese. So that would be kind of a, a project to find. But uh, I'm going to try to dig around because that would be hilarious to find. I think I saw it at the time. I think I saw it right after um, it aired. And um, like on just, TV at the hotel. Cool. It just looked cool. But uh, I'm going to try to look at that and try to find out. Uh, this was like 10 years ago, so I, it'd be hard to remember the title of the song, but uh, that's an idea. But, it'd be, it'd be great if stuff happens with the, with the pyro, my man. Yeah, no, we're, we're going to do it in Europe. We have another thing. We're, we're looking into inflatables. Like, did you ever, you ever see those stage inflatables like Creator has with the big, like, oh, demon? Like Kiss had on the 96 tour? Yes. Yeah. Really? Really? How, got to- what do you do with that? We got a place in Germany that that makes them. They made them for creator. And I guess they can travel because they deflate down into a case. So you could put it into a road case or a bin or whatever. Um, creator, I guess, just brought theirs to Southeast Asia. And it they just inflate it there. I, I'm, I don't know if they have to get the actual machine to inflate it or if they use like shop vacs or what. But we're looking into it. And uh, because we were either going to do a mascot or we were going to do like props, like uh, we have this album called Concrete Confessional, where I thought, oh, it'd be cool to have an inflatable confessional like pop up for when those songs from that album come into the set. But what was what do you remember? Like, what was the best production you say you've ever done, like with Megadeth or with another artist? Like, what was the coolest, most unique production? Oh, um by far again it was with that chinese artist ame um uh, she's actually taiwanese artist um ame um we did um this tour of asia was we went to so many cities that i had never ever even heard of you you never heard the name but when you arrive it's like 10 times bigger than new york and more crowded and bustling it's like (laughs) how could i never have heard of this city um it was, it was an insane, wonderful, wonderful tour. But on that tour, they were using these, I guess, hydraulic things that lift you so high off of the stage that um, it immediately cured your fear of heights um, just by doing it. Um, so you were on it and it, the platform raised up like kind of how... Uh, up. You know how like... Uh, you know how like Gene Simmons flies in God of Thunder to the top of the stage? Yeah. There's like a stage ramp up there and, and he kind of like flies up to it by himself. We did that, but not flying by ourselves. The actual, we had a separate stage that lifted all the way. So you could see us lifting all the way up to the, to practically the roof of the the stadium or arena or whatever it was. And it was just so incredibly high. It's just the strangest viewpoint to see the audience. And, and really, you don't want to be looking down that much when you're doing that. And luckily, it was one of those songs where you don't have to look at the instrument at all, which usually most of the songs, you don't have to look that much. But sometimes 
especially like in a, a, a context like that where there's a lot of weird keys, you have to look at your guitar. But thankfully, in this song, I could look straight ahead, not look down and um, interact with the singer. It was just the two of us up there and the band is like playing way below. And um, it was just a really, really great production. And they had all kinds of um, they had regular pyro, but a lot of the pyro they had done was with video um i guess led screens yeah. so it was actually kind of within scene so it didn't like first of all it wasn't dangerous and second of all it looked more realistic because it was like it became part of the entire stage rather than oh there's blowing up stuff on the stage so the whole stage become this one kind of fantasy world and i really like that and um I love all that stuff because, you know, growing up with Kiss and doing that. And and then this group, Momoito Clover, that I play with a lot um, in Japan, um, they do similar stuff to that. And they're always trying to do really innovative stage things. And uh, it's fun to, to be in that type of thing. My solo stuff doesn't uh, afford that type of uh, massive... Uh, financial production so to speak i mean they just spend tons and tons of money on it and um you know who knows you know they must be getting it back but i can't imagine that the cost of the type of things they do um i just love doing it and love uh being a part of it but i would hate to really i'm not really that creative when it comes to thinking of those kind of ideas the, the guys who do that for a living are just so brilliant with it you know i, I pretty much like the state of the guitar <laughs> Right on. Yeah, but I could see I could see some cool moments in in your solo sets for like low flying fog and and different LED lights and different um different imagery and and different uh landscapes on the screens and stuff. Like if you ever did a DVD and uh or, or I know nowadays it really would be like a, a collector's item sort of Blu-ray type of situation, right? If you, and you'd probably want to do it at a a legendary venue like you have in the past, but right. um, if you were going to do a new one, put I'll put my name in the hat to design uh, some of it. Cause I've been, I've been really getting into it. Cause I really? think, yeah. And, and I never, I don't know all the terms, but I know the type of mood to set for certain songs. We, we don't have a lot of songs like that. It's very fast, kind of hardcore thrash, whatever you want to call it crossover but there's like one part where there's a slow guitar going and we were going to have the fog come out and the lights go red. And we, we didn't get to do that. Um, but we're thinking about doing it for the fall tour because we have carcass and uh, harm's way and crypto. It's kind of more of a death metal, hardcore crossover bill. So it could be cool to just do something fun and different, but is there anything like you're not game for? Like if, if say Ame or one of these artists that you play with, if they're like, we want you to ride the zip line or we want you to, uh, you know, be playing while this tiger comes out or something like what, what's off limits for Marty. <laughs> That's very interested that you said that. Cause she actually did have a tiger come out when I played with, Ame. come on, <laughs> not a real tiger, not a real tiger, but you know, those Chinese tiger dragon, things where there's like 20 people inside this huge kind of a yes i don't know what it's made out of but we actually did that and uh, i had to play right with that and do all these choreographed mo motions with that you know sometimes when you see a chinese new year in uh, in chinatown they have those big things we had that all on stage and i'm so up for anything i'm, I'm really like you bring it on and I will do it. Cause I, I love those kind of creative ideas. Um, it, first of all, it takes some of the responsibility off the guitar work really, because what we're doing, especially when, when I'm playing my stuff, I'm just playing the music. I'm trying to make a performance and have eye contact with people and be excited about the music and play it. And anything that adds to the look of the show is um, I love all that. So like, there's nothing I'm not game for. Um, I don't think anyone has uh, asked me to do anything that uh, I've objected to. I think the hardest thing is occasionally um, to do choreographed things can be kind of tricky sometimes. Um, motions, um, band movements and movements like with the singer, the same type of motion and stuff. Sometimes uh, 
rhythmically, it's not, it's kind of counterintuitive to me. Um, so that takes a little work, but like any other kind of um, wild ideas or simple ideas, you know, um, are cool. And uh, on one of the, during the pandemic, I did one of those um, live, I can't think in English yet. Um, you know, that when you live, um, what's the word? Um, streaming. Yeah. Uh, live streaming. We did a live streaming concert, like right in the middle of pandemic when, when no one was uh, doing any concerts. And we did a collaboration with this uh, digital artist. And so that was really, really innovative with lots of um, uh, unique staging. And we did it in this huge sound studio where we went from one studio to another between songs in real time. And each one was a different setup. So it was like actually doing a music video, but with all the locations in the same building. And we do one song here, one song there. And um, that was a blast. It was totally fun. The hard thing about that was playing songs live with no audience there. I don't know if you did that during the pandemic, but that was a bitch. Yeah. Really, really hard to like act like, you <laughs> right. know, the adrenaline and the people and the good nervousness and all that stuff. It was very, very hard to get that going but uh i love the innovative um staging ideas that we got to do with that yeah a lot of the live streams were cool we didn't do one i i was against it i i don't know why i I remember thinking that it just was it was going to be a bunch of hassle basically because i had i was going to have to do a lot of the logistics on my own and do a lot of the heavy lifting and i didn't know if the juice was going to be worth the squeeze but we did one with an artist i managed uh, called crowbar and it went great and then they did one supporting clutch and that really went great and i was like ah maybe i was wrong about this i should have done it but i did one where you know like a cover song with max weinberg and um and uh, a bunch of other artists where you just perform the song for real and then they mix everybody together. And then however you record it while you're performing it, they just put that together in a screen like this, like on StreamYard or one of those streaming platforms. And that was fun. And we got a really, we got a lot of good feedback from that, which did make me think, Oh man, maybe we also, I didn't like the idea of charging for a pay-per-view Yes. Yes. I hated that. I absolutely hated that, but it had to be done because it cost a fortune to do. Yeah. But there were some cool ones. Like I think Vakken did a bunch of them from the whiskey. They might've reached out uh, or, or maybe I was talking, I think I was talking iced tea about it. And I think body count did theirs. Like it was virtual Vakken basically. And, um, and and I guess that production was good and, and people enjoyed it and they paid five bucks for the stream or or whatever it was. But uh, but I could see you and John five because we just had John on and oh. he, he was telling us about the tour. And um, by the time this airs, it'll be, I think, public. So but and if it's not, we'll edit this part out. But um, I could see you guys doing something like that. If you get to a really cool venue and they have the ability to stream it and charge five bucks. That could be really cool. Do, do you plan on collaborating together, like each coming out during your sets? We didn't do that this time, but I could totally see that happening. Uh, we had a total blast. Very short run in America. Uh, it was a blast. Our, our bands are completely different. What we're playing is completely different, but definitely a lot of guitar. No question about that. <laughs> so... Uh, I think for a lot of his fans, they discovered my music and vice versa. And uh, I would totally be up for anything like that. But I, I love the phrase that you just said. You didn't know if the, the juice was worth the squeeze. <laughs> is, is that yours or is that something people are saying nowadays? I think that was one of my dads. He probably got it from, I don't know, Archie Bunker or something. I don't know. I don't know where it comes from, but... But the juice has got to be worth the squeeze because sometimes I'll squeeze the shit out of some fruit and it doesn't. And I'm like, what did I get out of this? Nothing. But I will say, if and when this tour happens with you and John Five, it's going to be Europe. Like, what is it again? He was saying, because you did the States, it was a short run, but then you're going to go do Europe together. Oh, well, we're talking about that right now. It, it's definitely not confirmed at this point. So, okay. Uh, 
I would love to do it. It's just a matter of a lot of other things that uh, need to be cleared up on our side here in Japan. Um, I, I would absolutely love it. We got along so great. We're both like massive Kiss fans. I think he's the only guy who beats me as being a Kiss fan by far. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of super Kiss fans out there that are kind of bigger Kiss fans than I am, but he is uh, hands down without question uh, the biggest uh, Kiss fan that I know. And um, so, you know, we didn't really have enough time to really chat about the, you know, Kiss nerd stuff as as I would have liked, but um, I would look forward to doing anything else. And plus he's a super guitar player just a super player. So um, I, I'm looking forward to doing whatever we do next. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It seems like the audiences compliment each other and it, and people were really excited about those dates. I wish I could have made it to one. And I was telling John that uh, Gene, you know, announced a bunch of solo dates with the Gene Simmons band. And I was saying to John, you got to get, you got to, you got to get them to do naked city. And you got to go find him and get up there and play it with him. What would be the one you would want to jam with Gene? Like if Gene's like, Marty, listen, uh, you're, you're handsome. You're powerful. You're, you're, you're very popular in Japan as a, as a as kiss, you know, to, what, what song would you want to, if you could choose any kiss on to perform with Gene and the Gene Simmons solo band, what would it be? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I would want to like do she, because I love that bass solo in the middle. And, um, or unholy, even though I don't really care at all about the non makeup years. I think Gene and unholy, if Gene did a whole album of songs like unholy, it would just like open up the whole world for uh, the heavy side, you know, cause we all love Gene because of that whole God of thunder image and that heavy image. And I'd love to hear an entire album devoted to that. But, yes, um, but I can't believe you don't like animalize. No, nah, I don't hate what? it. But it's, I don't hate it, but I, I, I don't hate it at all. I actually like it, but it, I just don't put it in the same category as everything that came up to Dynasty. Okay. Um, and even Unmasked. I mean, Naked City, that, I, I love the Unmasked album as well. But uh, yeah, and, you know, every Kiss fan has their own little areas, you know, their little, little things. But uh yeah, I'm a makeup era guy for sure. But like Gene, Gene, he did the exact same thing when when your your um, mannerisms of Gene were right on. I did this <laughs> thing in Japan where he was in a movie called Detroit Metal City. And um, I got a bit part as playing guitar in Gene's band in that movie, which was like as a Kiss fan you know, okay, I'm done. I can, uh, I can die now kind of thing. So we had like three days filming together and it was wonderful because I was the only English person, English speaking person there. And we know Gene likes to talk. <laughs> and since I'm a big Gene fan, big kiss fan, I was a perfect target. And so we just chatted for the, you know, making a movie is like, it's all waiting 90% of the time. So we just chatted and um, we talked about like, we both love like 50s and 60s music and he's very, um, uh, he knows, he's very knowledgeable about little details about musical facts and things like that. So it was just a, a fan's dream come true. And, and, and uh, he was saying exactly like this, you're a powerful and attractive man, <laughs> you're just like everybody. But uh, it, it was kind of neat to be, uh, cornered by one of my favorite uh, favorite rock stars. I really liked it. So was this the Japanese version of the film and they called it Detroit Metal City instead of Detroit no, Rock City? No, no, no. It had nothing to do with the movie Detroit Rock City. Um, there was actually a manga, um, an animated comic um, called Detroit Metal City here. It had nothing to do with Kiss at all. Um, it, uh, it, was, it was a big hit, a huge hit, and it became a movie from from the manga and the movie was really really good um really excellent movie um of course if you blink you'd miss the part where i'm playing guitar there's one scene where gene is um 
he's having kind of a battle with this other, I guess, rival in the movie and Gene's band and that rival's band are playing like this battle thing. And that's where I come up and play. Um, it's, it's just a moment, but even that took like three days to film, but the movie was, it was a hit here. And, um, Gene was a trooper, man. He came all the way from like, there you go. That's it. Wow. He came all the way from uh, New Zealand to shoot this thing. And it was like he was wearing this insane heavy costume, way, way heavier than his uh, normal Kiss costume. And it was all waiting in that big, heavy costume. And he didn't complain the slightest. And uh, just, a, just a total pro. I was, I was impressed. Wow. That's because he invoiced them $1 million. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you bet. You bet. <laughs> Hey, everybody, just a quick interruption letting you know today's episode is brought to you by IndieMerchStore.com, your one-stop shop for all things metal, hardcore, death metal, deathcore, vegan metal, gluten-free metal, metal about decapitating cattle, and so much more. Head on over to IndieMerchStore.com, use the promo code JASTA10, and you'll save 10%. That is, it is that easy. So you want that cattle decap, gradient, long, bleach, wash, sweatshirt, the crew neck, it's 44 bucks. Not for you, Buster. You put in that JASTA10, boom, $4.99 right off the top, right off the rip. Say you want that death mid-era that beautiful death tie dye that they got, or that badass knocked loose old ham hoodie. Oldham, is it Oldham or Old Ham? Leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube. Use the code JASTA10 at IndieMerchStore.com. You'll see they have the Peeling Flesh Vinyl, the Massacre Neck Revolution Limited Edition 12 inch. They got Fallujah merch, Black Tongue. Shit, you want some Inferi Inferi sweatpants? They got it all. IndieMerchStore.com. Use the promo code JASTA10. Now back to the show. So would you do the cruise? Have you done the cruise? You have to do it. I would love to do it. I would love to do it. Um, I've only done one cruise. I did, uh, I did a cruise, um, uh, like right at the end of my 2016 or 18 American tour. I forget. Um, I remember doing it and loving doing the cruise, but I remember thinking, I would never ever go on a cruise if I wasn't playing on it. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> I just have no idea why it's a thing. Um, I Same. guess people who dig cruises have their own reasons. And I guess the rock cruise is a cool thing. Um, I would love to do the kiss cruise if they keep doing it. Who knows, you know, with the, the state of the band nowadays, but um, I would, I would be in there in a second. Well, when I have Gene on the show, which is going to happen this year, I will pitch that to Gene because that that needs to happen. You and John Five both on there. If they do one last one, that would be great. Oh Spe wow! Speaking of which, um, we got some good questions here in the chat. You know, I had I, I wanted Gene for episode seven hundred. I got Steve Vai, nice. and I was I love Steve, and I was like, all right, we'll make Gene happen down the line one of these days when he's free. But Steve was great, and this question reminded me of this from John Thompson. Shout out to John. He says, if Marty could assemble a generation axe slash G three type tour with three other guitarists, who would he choose? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, actually I've done something similar to that here in Japan. Uh, we called it guitar monsters and we did like, uh, your basic Tokyo, Osaka, Nagoya, um, run in Japan. And it was me. It was uh, Ichika, uh, uh, people who are into YouTube over there in America definitely know him, and uh, Takeyoshi Omura. And uh, Takeyoshi played in my band for eight years, and he played in baby metal for many years, and uh, super, super guitar player. So it was the three of us. And um, it was really a wonderful combination because my music is whatever that is, and Ichika's music is very... It's very peaceful, but it's very, very guitar centric, so to speak. So guitarists are just like mind boggled by his playing. And then Takeyoshi's band is kind of like really straight up metal with really wild guitar in it. So there's three different kinds of guitar. So that worked out really well. But um, wow, that, I, I'd never really thought about that. Um, there's a guy named Matea Sasato, who I love his playing. I would love to have him come out. Um, of course, 
any day of the week, I would love to do it with Steve Vai or Joe Satriani. So uh, yeah, call me, guys. <laughs> I would love to do that. Um, you heard it here. That would be incredible. Satch was on the show. He was great. Yeah, I, I, I went to that show when it came uh, near me. It was incredible. Oh, yeah. Those guys are the players, man. I love those players. Um, you know, really, it's not so much the package. I think I just love to play with anybody who I respect. And I respect so many of the guitarists, uh, recording artists out there that I think any combination of people would be just as equally fun for me. That would be incredible. We'll have to tell Satch. Yeah. Anytime. I mean, he's he's expanding that show. It seems like it just keeps getting bigger. I mean, when the one I went to, I think, was with Phil and with uh, Petrucci, with John Petrucci. Um, here's a good one from Jake. I did see this headline. I didn't click on it. This says, from Jake Olszewski, from Marty, you recently said you hope guitar solos die a slow and painful death. See, I didn't even click on that because I was like, that's got to be clickbait. Taken, right. out of, taken out of context jake You're says right he says i was too lazy to read the article can you discuss that <laughs> same here jake <laughs> yeah i'm glad you were too too lazy to read it because i didn't say it <laughs> you know usually um when clickbait happens they take something that you actually said and take it out of context in this case they take something that i never said and just embellish that so um you're better off for not reading it. It got cleared up. Um, the fine people at Guitar World figured out what happened. Um, apparently, when an interview that I did was transcribed, it was transcribed electronically. And um, uh, you know how that is. You know, yeah, anything yep. can happen. And um, just there was a lot of misquotes, things I didn't say, things that with one word, change change the meaning of what i said it was just kind of like a mess and it didn't look good for me and it definitely didn't look good for guitar world but we cleared it all up because uh you know we both cared enough about um each other because you know they've done a lot for me over the years i've done a lot for them over the years and um uh we cared enough to clear it up so if, if you even care enough about the topic i mean it's just it's not even an important article in the first place but if you care about it you can go online and see you know what guitar world posted about that and what i posted about that but uh it's really not important anyway man <laughs> it makes you think though especially before we had the internet because i see it all the time with the youtube uh transcriptions or with the zoom call transcriptions after the zoom or even with the subtitling on youtube videos where they will completely mess up even a simple line because it's an out it's a it's ai or whatever so it makes me think man it would be great to go back in time and actually listen to the tapes in those old interviews when they would pull the quote to put on the cover of circus or metal edge or metal maniacs or even some of the ones that i did for like metal hammer and rock sound and kerrang I would like to go back and listen to those tapes and see how it was transcribed. Someone should do a whole podcast about that. That's because... a great topic and, and completely <laughs> topical for the story we just talked about. Because when I saw the article came out, I'm like, what the hell is this? I got a hold of the guy who wrote it. And I said, dude, play the tape of this. I want to hear the tape of this because I know for a fact I didn't say this stuff. And the tape had been erased. Uh, you know, the data was gone. And um, and I know it was an honest mistake because I know the the writer who did it and he was not that type of person at all. But mistakes happen. And um, in the world of AI and clickbait, you know, mistakes look like the real thing. So, uh, you know, it, it just kind of sucked. But you're so right because those those recorded interviews say so much more because you've got the inflections of the voice. You've got the, you know, you've got the nuance, you've got the, what words mean more than others. You know what I mean? In black and white, things take on a completely different meaning often from what they were when they were actually said. So like a medium like this, like a podcast is pretty much, the truest form you see facial expressions and you hear the answer to the actual question and all that. But it is very interesting, especially for rock fans, because I kind of, 
don't like reading stuff when I don't really trust it that much. And it, it kind of sours me on my rock fan experience, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think the majority of us knew that that was not something especially anybody who's ever talked to you or read previous interviews or watched podcasts with you. I think they knew that that's not something that is even in your type of character. Like you, right. Right. what would be the reason to say that yeah. and, and why, but, um, but yeah, that's the kind of world we're living in. It's like, you see the headline, you don't have time to click on it. But that that's the point of having a headline like that. So they get their clicks. And I, Look, if there's great writers out there, I want to support them. I'll I'll sign up to their Substack or whatever. We do have to kind of change that model. So when they monetize stuff, we need to click on the positive stuff. So that way we can change that trend or change that, uh, I guess, whatever system that is where it's like, they get more ad dollars for it's a very interesting topic because it is human nature to look at a train wreck it's very human nature so when you're thinking completely in algorithms it makes total sense to do whatever it takes to get clicks to your page so it's very hard to find an actual solution that is good in a human way because in essence we're kind of monetizing the fact that it's human nature to want to see something that is negative and i don't know if that is something that can ever change so the fact that we're rewarding that um but in actuality you're just rewarding business and that makes total sense so i get that but it's really kind of an, an endless cycle that I really have no idea what the solution is um, for us as the people who are being written about. You know what I'm saying? Um, I can only say that if you're a fan of somebody, just read the piece, read the entire article, and and you'll probably find something that conflicts the kind of clickbaity title a little bit in there. Um, but it's really kind of a hard, I, I really have no idea what the, the solution could ever be because if there's an accident on the, on the road, it's just natural to turn your neck for like a second and look at it. And that's what we're dealing with, with the clicks. So it's a very, very interesting human nature experiment. Yeah. And it, it turns people off from doing the podcast. Like I haven't had Portnoy on, I think since that probably right around that that G3 tour. And I don't, I, I forget what the media took out of context or if it, it might not even have been from my podcast, but when he explained like why he doesn't want to do podcasts anymore, I got it because once it gets, it, once it travels all over the world and like, especially for international artists like yourself that have huge followings in South America and Japan, once it gets translated, the retraction is never seen. The correction is never seen. And, uh, and I, I wish that there was a way that we could do it where, you know, like your team, obviously you and your team saw it and then guitar world corrected it and it was good. I guess we have to have more checks and balances. So this way, if something is really egregious, <clears throat> like the case of, you know, Brent from Mastodon, he didn't use a slur, but people said on this show, you know, he used a, a, a homophobic slur and he didn't. Um, but that's what people will remember. And I doubt he'll be on again, you know? So it's, yeah, there's gotta be a way there, there is a funny, <clears throat> excuse me. There is a funny thing I saw where this guy, he's like the most viewed, one of the most viewed cooking pages on Instagram. But what he'll, what he'll do is he'll say he's making guacamole. He'll leave the tag, like the label on the avocado when he's mashing it up and he'll put it into the dish. And people are like, dude, you, th the tag is still on the price tag is still on the, the skin of the avocado. What are you doing? But that's engagement, which kicks him into the algorithm. So he does, he's tricking people into engaging with it by doing something silly like that. And people lose their mind. Cause they're like, you're going to eat the label, but they don't know they're being manipulated into boosting his presence and his views. Yeah. See, it's those kind of clever, 
kind of harmless little innovations that are, are more kind of heartwarming, you know what I mean? <laughs> Rather than like, wow, this guy might have said something that might offend somebody, but let's put that in the headline. Rather than that, I think the cooking example is fantastic. It's it's just a fantastic uh, kind of hack into that. You know, I, I, I like hearing that kind of thing. A cheat code. Yeah, you'll see it where they'll put dates up for a tour or they'll put a band name and they'll make it two words or they'll put an artist name and they'll spell it wrong. And then people be like, I can't believe you spelled so-and-so's name wrong. And they don't know that they did it on purpose to boost, you know, the views and the algorithms. Because otherwise you have to pay to get your results higher in Google searches or to get your Facebook posts seen by the accounts that follow you. It's, mm. it's, it's a dog eat dog world out there, but let's go, let's go to the chat. There's some good stuff in here. Um, here's one from uh, John Thompson. This, this November will be 30 years since euthanasia. Any thoughts looking back on that album and tour and any plans to commemorate that album this year? Uh, well, um, that was probably the most fun period of time while I was in Megadeth. Um, euthanasia. It was a absolutely fantastic tour. Um, the band was in top form. We got along so well, as you can see in the photos from that era, it was just like, we were like the smiling heavy, heavy metal band, which <laughs> in photos is admittedly not necessarily as cool as being a little bit more, uh, grimacing but it was just the way we were we were on top of the world and enjoying it and it came out in the music so there was absolutely nothing wrong with that uh loved it um i'm not really such a big look back and commemorate things type of guy and uh um i think i've done plenty of stuff with megadeth over the last year um with budokan and and Bakken. so uh I don't really see doing any more stuff like that, but uh, euthanasia. Yeah. That, that was a, that was a killer. I loved it. So if they reached out to you to do say like liner notes for a box set or a new packaging, would you, you know, pen any memories, a couple paragraphs or quotes for the press release or anything like that? I never say never to anything, especially with Megadeth because uh, I'm their biggest fan. And uh, if it's going to help, Megadeth do their thing. I'm there. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not against anything, but uh, haven't heard anything about it. And and uh, yeah, I, I'm not a big commemorator type of guy. Thirty years anniversary. It's always the anniversary of something. <laughs> if the longer your your career is, you got people telling you it was like ten years since this happened, and you know it's it's wonderful and as a fan like when i'm a fan of somebody i i know all of those little dates and stuff but uh, as far as my own career i'm just too busy in the actual moment of right now to know uh what happened 10 20 years ago hey everybody it's jamie here letting you know the many eyes album the light age is out now and we are now exclusively distributed through death wish inc and they have their own color variant of the vinyl the new sun flare vinyl is up now for sale at deathwishinc.com go support keith and nick and the boys on their tour with some 41 you can go to many they have merch over there as well or you can get the vinyl in person at the show leave a comment if you're going to uh see some 41 and many eyes together on the road or maybe you want to go see their special cd release show the 20th at the auto bar um in baltimore that's going to be a rocker too once again the new album is the light age by many eyes music featuring your boy keith buckley formerly of every time i die executive produced by yours truly you can get it at martyrstore.net deathwishinc.com perseverancemedia.com and manyeyesmusic.com now back to the show i'm the same way but the nostalgia freaks will break you down eventually they've gotten to me now and once they get their hooks in it's they make you feel bad for not remembering the stuff so oh. now so now i'm like i'm all in Especially because I have a guy in our band, shout out to Wayne. He's really good with all the dates. He's really good at all the, the details, especially because he teched for the band, even when he wasn't in the band. So he'll remember certain tours, but I'm trying to think about euthanasia. And if I saw you guys on that tour, 
that wh- who was support that was that wasn't seven dust right because that was probably 96 i wouldn't remember we were on tour for like 11 months straight and we had different packages and i wouldn't i know we did something with seven dust i don't know if that's on which tour that was and we played with everybody man we played with uh stone temple pilots with corn yep. with fear factory um alice in chains and I, I chronologically i have absolutely no idea at the time the only thing i cared about was playing and uh getting my rocks getting my rocks off if you know what i mean and um you know no idea what where you're at where what city you're at what date it is what leg of the tour it is and i'm still the same way now you know it's i'm just worrying about what i'm going to do today and on the very next project whatever it is being a tour or release or all that kind of stuff so uh but i have to say that uh, i absolutely love it when fans know those things because it makes me feel like they put importance on like when things came out, they put importance on a release or a tour or a video or whatever it is. And, and so that means a lot to me because I know how I feel when I think about, you know, when I was, you know, a huge kiss fan or a big Ramones fan, I would know all those little minutia. And I know absolutely none of that minutia with my own stuff. So it really kind of, makes me feel very, very good and appreciative when uh, fans know it about my own stuff, really. So you don't remember when Dave said, all right, we're going to all wear these white button downs. Because when was that? Like, I remember definitely that was a thing. Those white shirts, right? Like the white. Uh, Maybe it was just him. I don't remember wearing any white shirts. Okay. So maybe Mike can look this up. Look up Euthanasia Tour. I thought there was a... I thought there was a tour where I was like, huh, the white button downs. And we had always heard that, like, because we would submit, we submitted on every tour, every Megadeth tour from 96 or 97 to whenever we ended up finally getting the tour. I think it was in 2023. We had heard that, like, Dave, you know, doesn't think you guys dress like a band. Like, we had heard that. And we were like, yeah, dude, because we're just a hardcore, you know, crossover hardcore thrash whatever metallic hardcore type of band yeah we don't we don't wear the leather pants or the button downs but, we, but we'll go out there and we'll you know we'll we'll get the crowd warmed up and we did luckily he, he did come and check us out a bunch of different nights and and was was stoked on us you know trying to get that energy you know that vibe going for trivium and lamb of god and megadeth but we always thought that that was funny if, if it was true i i have to ask dave that when i see him Again. Yeah, you should ask Dave. I don't remember anything like that. And there was never really any kind of, okay, let's all do this. Let's all wear this. There was never anything like that. But what I remember is like when I first joined the band, there was a definite um, intentional image of cleanliness and um, kind of no bullshit like we all no one was like wearing like any kind of fashion armani suits or anything or no one was wearing like all this bling or anything and no one was like doing anything like that we just were looking like the boy next door t-shirt jeans and high tops i remember that was very um it was very it was almost like the ramones in that respect that we kind of had our uniform it wasn't the exact same thing but we kind of i like that very much when i first joined the band because up until then there was never really any talk everybody just showed up wearing whatever they wanted so there was one dude who looked like he was in a glam band one dude looked like he was in a uh, thrash band one dude looked like he was in r and b blues or whatever and and in Megadeth, it's like you got four guys and they they look like they're on the same team. And I thought that was uh, that was one of the very first things that I liked when I first joined. Right on. Yeah. I always thought you could never be fat and be in Megadeth. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like there's no way. Yeah. Even, even on one of the last shows, I went in to just say goodbye to Dave because I wasn't sure if I was going to be at the very last, second to last show. And he's in there with the weights you know still still doing it getting ready to go on looking good lean and mean you know much respect um but it would be uh it would be cool if i could find this fucking 
white shirt picture. Maybe I'm thinking of a different lineup then where they all had the white and it was very crisp and clean. And it's not like, um, you know, when the, when you do video shoots and stuff, they say, don't wear light colors for, and I never understood why. And I would be like, well, look at Megan. They're wearing, look at Dave. He's wearing the, the white button, <laughs> the white button. Yeah. Down. I, I don't know. I, there was a time, I don't know if it was euthanasia. Maybe it was that, um, we started to get a stylist involved with, uh, are a wardrobe person uh, it for most of the time it was just our own clothes and we had someone on the road like making sure that they were ironed or whatever washed but then like halfway through we had someone actually choosing you know, you know for better or for worse i don't i don't remember being that that excited about it but uh they would just pick cooler clothes. You know what I mean? They would go to thrift shops and, and they would go to like uh, uh secondhand stores and buy like kind of trendy. So we look more like, you know, maybe more like Aerosmith than like some thrash band. Cause we were kind of like getting into a bigger league and, and it was decided that we would try to look cooler. And uh, it's just, I, I remember that. And, and, uh, now here in Japan, like you can't do anything without having a million people decide on what you wear and stuff like that. And that's, so I'm used to it now, but in Megadeth, it was a little bit, it felt kind of out of place because we were kind of like you guys, you know, it's just that we're just a hardcore thrash band, you know, playing heavy music. So we got some like funky chick telling us <laughs> what to wear. This just was counter, um, counterintuitive, but, um, you know, we, I, I remember being very happy that uh, our image was very much like a group. I remember liking that about the band. Are there any post Marty Megadeth jams that you really like, like Head Crusher or any standout songs from the catalog after you left that you're like, wow, they're, they're, they're still ripping it? Actually, embarrassingly, I've heard like precious little since I left the band. Um, really almost nothing because I just, it kind of went beyond my radar. I wasn't following it very much, but the times that I did hear things, um, I thought, yeah, they're still killing it. They're doing great. And uh, I remember when uh, they got Kiko in the band, I heard that, um, that album. And, uh, I was like, wow, this, this definitely kicks ass and Kiko's tearing it up. And, um, yeah, but I wouldn't know particular songs or anything like that. It was funny because when I played with them at Budokan, um, there was a time in the set list where I'm supposed to come out and play. And it was like right after a couple of their uh, post-Marty, I, I would say, songs that I didn't know. And usually when you do a gig, you got someone who leads you to the stage. Like when you're doing a guest spot to say, OK, you're going to go on in five minutes 10 minutes, get ready, let's go. There was nobody there. I was like backstage <laughs> and like I had like the monitor on in the backstage room. I'm like, I don't know this song. I don't know the title of it. It's on the set list. Um, there's like three or four songs in a row, a row that I don't know. I, maybe I should go now. And nobody came for me. <laughs> it, it was weird because the staff was like totally, totally treating me like so great the entire day. It's like, can I get you something to eat? Can I get you something to drink? Is your room nice? They were so cool. But when it come, came time to the stage, play, play on stage, there's like nobody there. And I'm like, <laughs> somebody's going to come and get me, right? I'm like, nobody was coming. How did so you I'm, figure it out? <laughs> I just randomly went there and like <laughs> literally about two minutes when I arrived at the stage was the song that I was supposed to play. So, you know, maybe I should have heard a little bit more of the, <laughs> the more recent Megadeth stuff, but I remember, oh man, I have no idea what song this is. It just sounds like Megadeth, but I don't know. It's not one of the songs I know. So, uh, yeah, but they, 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 they always kill it, man. And, and the band is just like on fire now and um totally killer i i had that happen at, at milwaukee metal fest machine head wanted me to do a song with them and then i go up and i'm they have these like scrims where you can't see them and then they're on in-ears so you can't even hear you can only hear the drums and then you can barely hear what they're playing over the pa and then no one knew what song i was supposed to go out <laughs> same thing <laughs> that's exactly what i thought of when you said that same um, thing yeah so Animalize has got a 40th anniversary of Animalize this September. 
you got to revisit Animalize, Marty. It goes so hard. I remember getting the tape for a dollar at Rhymes Records, and and with all the the because I loved Leopard Print. Like I had a poster. I think it was like Samantha Fox. Remember her? Oh yeah, with the leopard print. Oh man, don't e- don't even get me started. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna have to check it out because uh, I pretty much wrote off all the non makeup albums. But uh, since you're into it, I'm going to put it up. And I remember they did an MTV live video for that tour. I don't know if you remember that. Yep. I just remember that I thought Eric Carr was way too good to be in Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed the magic of Peter Chris's kind of randomness and just non-knowledge of what normally would go in a song <laughs> like that. And just so- somehow I had a bond with that connection of kiss. So I thought Eric Carr is just too rad for this band and it's just making the band sound too rad. And, and, and I don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. We, we had Vinnie Vincent from Bridgeport right here in Connecticut. So that was like, that was an early Connecticut claim to fame. And then, uh, cause what, like, so after animal eyes, when did Vinnie Vincent join? I'm like, so, um, I think the next one, right after Animalize, or the one after that. before Animalize. Oh no, you're right. I think he was before. Yeah, he was before because on, he played on Creatures of the Night. Yeah, and I remember hearing Creatures of the Night, and I'm like, man, Ace has really changed his vocabulary <laughs> since the last album. It was a moron. I co- I would totally believe that it was all Ace. You know, his picture was on the cover. Different tone, different playing. Everything was totally different, but I thought, oh, maybe he really developed in, in the last album or so. He really has a lot of different phrases now. That's what kids think, man. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Well, I, I I hope that I really hope you get to jam with Gene and the solo band. Man, I would I would just love that. Uh, anything to make that happen, I would be up for that would that would be incredible all right so before we get out of here where can they find you where so what is the schedule like and when is the record and what other plans that do you have coming up yeah i forgot the the main reason that's what i like talking to you about (laughs) sorry that's why i always like talking to you because like it's it's absolutely just like two dudes sitting backstage waiting to go on or something and it's absolutely not like doing press. I love that. Um, Thank you. No, yeah, it's, it's I, I, great to chat. I wish I wish we had a a recorder when you and Gene were shooting the breeze during this manga. Oh man, that would have been a that podcast. Would, that would have been a podcast, man. Hours of it. He just like telling me inside kiss stuff, you know. Oh my god, it was great. Um, no, but uh, that's the main thing that. Uh, I at least want to get people to know is I have a new album coming out called drama on May 17th worldwide and May 22nd in Japan. And, um, the first song from that album is called illumination and it's out. Um, you can hear it online and, um, just go to my social media and you'll see tons of that stuff. Um, this is the album that, you know, I say it every time, but this time, uh, it's kind of like I did it a completely different way. I recorded the entire album on like all like the most highly maintained vintage instruments you could imagine along with my modern gear. So it's, I've got the biggest, uh, palette of sounds I've ever had. And, uh, it's, uh, it's not exactly like my album scenes, but it's in that vein, meaning it's unlike Inferno or wall of sound where I'm just full on barreling out heavy the whole time. It's uh, it's the total romantic side. It's all ballads. There's only one heavy track put in the middle of it just for contrast, but this is a, uh, it's, it's the romantic side. It's the orchestral side. It's the type of music where, um, you're I'm trying to make music that makes people feel uplifted when they hear it and, you know, tears and uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, goosebumps. goosebumps and um, chills and all. that's what I'm aiming for. And uh, I'm very pleased with it. So, uh, 
Yeah, just uh, check out uh, the drama album coming out in May and the, the new single Illumination. And uh, I'll be talking about this online everywhere else. So we don't <laughs> I'm glad we got to talk about also fun stuff this time. No, this is great. We're looking forward to the record and I'm sure all the Marty collectors are going to want to go and pre-order it. And that's my records coming out that day too. And just for all, that is the name of the No, I, I have not gotten a cease and desist yet. Yep. May 17th. So wow. I'm glad you haven't got a cease and desist for that. <laughs> We're on the same date. So like when you go on May 17th, there's only two albums that you need to get. And Three. these are it. Three Gate Creeper too. Check out Gate Creeper. Some good good death metal. I think they're they're coming out that day. Actually, there might be a lot of records coming out that that day. But I love that you're doing all ballads. So there's yeah. so there's some children might be conceived to this album, is what you're I saying. I hope so. I hope so. I really hope so. Or at least like tried to be conceived. The act of conception. Yes. No. I but like I that. Assume, I assume your album is very heavy. Oh yeah, it's I got Chuck Billy on there. I got uh, Scott Ian on there. Phil Demel's on there. Uh, Zetro from Exodus. It's just a love letter to thrash. So, dude, I, after your record is you're totally obliterated by your album and just a <laughs> for all, and then you can go listen to drama and totally chill it down, bring it down, and just feel like you're uplifted. You've been to the depths of hell, and now you're in the glowing halos of heaven. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait to hear it. It, it. I'm. I'm thinking like, you know that song "Sisters" by Steve Vai. Sure, sure, sure. Is it in that kind of realm with that? Beautiful, I don't think like, so. No, it's closer to like uh, uh, my Japan Heritage theme song that I did. Okay. Um, it's closer to that. It's very orchestral and very. Uh, uh, you know, if you like my music, you'll really like it. If you don't like my music, I think you're, you're going to be disgusted by it. <laughs> Well, Dude, I, I got to get to the next, next yes. thing, but thank you so much, Marty. A, Appreciate the time you, Jamie, as usual. And, All the uh, best. And we'll make sure we get some pre-orders out there for drama May 17th. And we'll hopefully see out there. Maybe I'll see you at one of these gene shows. I hope so, man. That would be killer. Thanks brother. All right. And Great chat. And so much, Jamie. Take, take care. care. You too. Quick little outro for you here. Thank you so much for sticking with us through the hiatus, through the summer. It was nice to have a little break, but we're going to be back in full force. And we have a bunch of episodes ready to come out for you. We got Kobe, Jacoby from uh, Papa Roach. We got John Five coming up. We we watched Deadpool and Wolverine. So Howard Jones and Charlie Belmore are back. And we'll be coming out with that episode of How Awesome Is This? Hopefully this week as well. And I am headed out on the Hapri tour soon, but... Also got to sit down with Miles Kennedy uh, from Alter Bridge, who has a new solo album, which is coming out October 11th on Napalm Records. So if you want to hear that before everyone else, sign up to Gas Digital or sign up to the Patreon, patreon.com slash Josta. And right now we have the new Many Eyes music album out. Go to manyeyesmusic.com. It's called The Light Age, features Keith Buckley from Every Time I Die, formerly of Every Time I Die. And my boys, Charlie and Nick, worked on the record. They're absolutely killing it right now. The record came out amazing. You can get it at deathwishinc.com. You can get it at manyeyesmusic.com. And you can get it at uh, martyrstore.net as well. Also, thank you to Blast Beats Vinyl. You can still use our code. It still works. Blastbeatsvinyl.com. Use the code MMF and you will save 10%. Also, thank you to IndieMerchStore.com. Gotta love Indie Merch Store. And as we gear up for Milwaukee Metal Fest 2025, as we start uh, laying out all the bands, you'll see we're going to do a bunch of stuff with Indie Merch Store. They're going to have a stage. They're the best. We love Indie Merch Store. Support them. Show them just to show listeners move the needle. Use that code just to 10 at checkout at IndieMerchStore.com. Also, I am going out on tour with Hatebreed. The, the meet and greets are almost all gone. So I think there's still a couple left for San Antonio, a couple left for Riverside, maybe Greensboro, but that was almost gone. And maybe a pair or two for Boston or Portland, but those are almost gone as well. Go to martyrstore.net, M-A-R-T-Y-R-S-T-O-R-E.net. Let me know if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, hit the bell. 
Well, let us know in the comments if you are coming out to a show. We want to see you there. All right. Love you all. Thank you all. Drink your coffee. Do your push-ups. Listen to, listen to death metal. And I'll be back with, I think, John 5. Bye-bye. Executive producers, Jake Olszewski, Ben Lee, AJ Lewis, Garrett Keeping, Dan Smith, Nick Torito, JJ Hernandez, Joe Bartovic, Jason Jarvis, Chris Larice, Alex Smolin, Todd McKee, John Blewett, Richard Miller, Kyle Marg, Nate Leffingwell, Morgan Costner, Mark Tag, Zapagor Waikato, Niall Scollard, Kathy D'Ambrosio, Justin Steven, Jack Flanders, the Pit Commander, Andy Wilson, Jeffrey Kuhn, Kimo Humalamaki, Jonathan Metis, Brandon Cooper, Matthew Jankowskis, Jamie Kutcher, Ryan Undercoffler, Matt West, Ryan Maurice, Chad Green, Dallas Hendricks, Jacob Arensberg, Kenneth Moore, Kona Butterflies, Stephen Helm, Richard McIntosh, Jeff Stevenson, Ryan Williams, Larry Tooley, Dallas Bolin, Ryan St. Nathan Rex Madrid, Cameron Hendricks, Scandalous Official, Joe Motson, Let's Talk Resident Evil, Andrew Chase, Guy on the Couch, Chris Winchester, Antonio Reyes, Joe Otson, Dustin Stone, Lee Walker, Ryan Levson, John Hankis, Robert Bushaw, Troy Seal, Mark Horror Armenta, Jay Liberston, Nick Fowler, Mike Horgan, Emma Horgan, Arnorock, Patrick King, Oscar Brummett, Stacy Steinecke, Fernando Somoza, Patrick O'Brien, Dominique Zimmer, Ryan Sanders, Lara Snyder, Daniel Burt, Milwaukee Metal Sausage, Adam Boss, Adam Mecklenburg, Thank you.